Welcome to this week's episode of the series, Viewing Multidimensional Poverty from Many Angles. I'm James Foster, co-director of the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP, of the George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs in Washington, DC. With me today is Sabina Alkire, director of the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, or OFI, in Oxford's Department of International Development. We're glad you have joined us today for the presentation, The Policy and Advocacy Use of Multidimensional Poverty Measures by David Stewart and Sola Engelbert's daughter of UNICEF with commentary by Gonzalo Hernandez Licona, director of the Multidimensional Poverty Peer Network. Thank you uh, speakers for being here today. Uh, in just a moment, Sabina will describe the series and introduce today's speakers. But first, I'd like to briefly introduce our institute. IIEP supports research, enhances teaching and learning, and convenes nonpartisan discussions of the key questions facing the international community. We do so with the help of a staff of 50 or more students who assist faculty with research, create a vibrant social media presence, and help run our many events, including two later this week. On Wednesday at 12.30 Eastern Time, our Facing Inequality series will bring Neil Cummins from the LSE to GW for a discussion of his paper, Hidden Wealth. On Friday at the China Conference series, our very own Stephen Kaplan will present his new book, Globalizing Patient Capital, The Political Economy of Chinese Finance in the Americas. Last week, our multidimensional measurement series featured Ricardo Santos of UNU Wider discussing wealth inequalities in Mozambique. And we also had a second event co-sponsored by IIEP, OFI, and UNDP's Human Development Report Office. It was Steve Killalay joining uh, IIEP to discuss his newest book, Peace in the Time of Chaos, with HDRO Director Pedro Conceixao and GW's National Security Studies Program Director, Matt Levenger. Next week's multidimensional presentation will feature Nils Gred of the World Food Program discussing refugees, relief programs, and poverty using the MPI in Turkey. I hope to see you there. But if you miss any of our events, you can watch them asynchronously on our YouTube channel, IIEP GW. Now, with any further ado, let me turn it over to Sabina for her comments. Sabina? Thank you, James, and greetings all. It's, it's lovely to be together. Um, this is a seminar series in which um, we have different institutions and people from different institutions presenting how multidimensional poverty measures are being used, applied, modified, and innovated upon in their context in order to meet the ever-changing demands and also in order to um, expand the policy uses and the understandings of multidimensional technologies. So this week we're absolutely delighted to welcome um, this seminar on the policy and advocacy use of multidimensional poverty measures in UNICEF. Speaking to us are two fantastic experts in the field um, David Stewart is the Chief of the Child Poverty and Social Protection Work in UNICEF headquarters. And he leads, therefore, UNICEF's global advocacy on child poverty and social protection. And he chairs a many institution global coalition to end child poverty. Um, he's also developing the frameworks and the guidance that, uh, that UNICEF will use to address child poverty and to strengthen the policies that in the end fight child poverty. So it's really a delight to have David participate here. And he is joined by his colleague Sola Engelitz Dorter, who is the social policy specialist in UNICEF and also has wide country experience in East Africa. Um, she was leading on the from the UNICEF side when Rwanda developed their multidimensional child poverty analysis. And she then also is supervising different UNICEF country offices that are seeking to measure child poverty and then use those measures for policy actions. Um, so it's also fascinating that although she has all of this work on measurement, she has a degree in anthropology, among other things. 
So that is our speaker lineup. And I'm also genuinely delighted to welcome as discussant Gonzalo Hernandez Licona, who directs the Multidimensional Poverty Peer Network or MPPN, a group of 60 participating countries, um, which is a South-South network of countries interested in measuring multidimensional poverty and using those measures for policy. Gonzalo also previously directed Coneval, the center for the that oversaw the measurement of multidimensional poverty in Mexico and is very familiar with their journey towards understanding child poverty in that context. So it's a wonderful lineup uh, and a dynamic exchange and I look forward to it. Thank you all so very much and over to you, David and Sola. So just to say huge thanks for inviting us uh, here, Sabina, Kyle, James, it's really a pleasure to be with you and to have a chance to talk about this issue with, with so many people who, who think about it as we do. Um, Sola and I are here together. We worked very closely together on this, on this paper. I'm going to be doing the initial presentation. And as Kyle correctly pointed out before the call, the more difficult the questions come, the more we are likely to hear from Sola, who is really uh, uh, pivotal behind, behind doing all this work. So we have, I think, about a half an hour, 40 minutes. Let's see how much of it we use. And I'm going to be sharing a presentation. So what we're going to be talking about is um, some work we've been doing to really look in detail at the policy uses of multidimensional poverty measures. Um, this is the outline of, of how we'll be going through this, this conversation. First, to give a sense of what the motivation for this assessment was from our, our perspectives. Look at the methodology and the approach we took in, in putting it together. Discussing the framework of impact and really hear the conclusions, what we learned from all of the work that we've, that we've gleaned from, from the various examples. Then a piece looking at the implications for measurement. So from everything we've learned on impact, does, how does that feed back into what we may know about how, how we could look at measurement? And then end with some future directions um, and some, some of the sort of unknowns that we have to work through. So in terms of motivation, I just wanted to start with, with this slide. I mean, I, I live with child poverty all the time. So its importance is so clear to me. Um, and but I can imagine, you know, you think, oh, it's UNICEF. They're going to talk about child poverty. I had a, a, a boss once who said to me, David, you have to realize you don't really work for UNICEF. You work for children, and you're currently working for children, uh, UNICEF. And I think that's a very nice way of of framing what we what we do. Um, and so it's it's always important, I think, to get across why child poverty is such an important and distinct issue that needs to be focused on, because I think that can sometimes be it can sometimes be subsumed onto poverty more generally. Um, I mean, first of all, and this should be the only thing that we have to say, is that it matters to children and is a violation of their rights. Growing up in poverty, a bit monetary or multidimensional, um, is no way to grow up. Um, and it, it's important to say that poverty is different for children because of their particular life stage. So that involves both the aspects or dimensions of poverty, which may be particularly important, but also its long term consequences. So if when a child falls into poverty at a certain stage, misses nutrition, misses an education, it is a very long run back. Uh, so it has these lifetime consequences. The data pretty much regardless of the data you use shows consistently that children are more likely to be poor than adults. So we're looking at a devastating problem, which is high in prevalence. Um, and the implications for children play through generations and affect society as a whole. Uh, this is sort of a statement of the obvious, but I think it doesn't always get fully seen. So what we're seeing in child poverty today, we will be sowing in the future. And despite the urgency around child poverty, it often receives very little attention. When you look at poverty analysis, more likely than not, despite the efforts of so many, children won't be considered uh, explicitly. And that's something that we, we really work to try and change. And then finally, just to, to make the point that it's actionable. There are solutions. There are things that can be done about it. It is a problem with a solution. And that really, I think, raises the moral necessity to look at it, to understand it, and to, to respond to it. I also just added this final uh, little slide at the bottom, this little bullet at the bottom, which is just to stress that for, for children following the Convention on the Rights of the Child, children are zero to 18. And the reason I stress that is because I think so often, if people don't know it, work proceeds and we work with the World Bank a lot, but nonetheless, to this day, they'll be producing zero to 12, zero to 15 estimates. So the more that we can spread the word, 
that we're looking at uh, we're looking at children zero to eighteen as well as subdivisions. That's uh, I think that's that's important. So it's something which I always appreciate if people take forward with them. So UNICEF's work on multidimensional poverty is a lot. So here you will see the range of countries that have done multidimensional poverty reports in the past, I think it's sort of maybe 10 years have done reports, about 70 countries uh, across all regions. And when we look at our uh, indicators, so as, as UNICEF, you know, you're always in touch what a country is doing, you'll see 100 countries normally will be working on multidimensional poverty throughout the course of a normal year and working with governments. That's what UNICEF does, always working with governments. So it really is a, a huge amount of work that is ongoing. So getting this work right can have huge implications for children. Um, and if we're, if we're not hitting all the right notes or doing things as best we can, we're really missing out on opportunities. So this is really one of the key drivers behind um, the, the, the work that we wanted to do. But in a way, put most simply, what drove this is a question that we receive not infrequently, which is, what do we do with it? UNICEF is, has become very used to producing multidimensional poverty measures, and it becomes almost automatic. Um, and for our social policy colleagues, these are the colleagues who will be, you know, doing the measurement with government. You, you just take it as read. It's what you do. When I was working in Uganda, I did a multidimensional poverty measurement. But then you, you do have people who take a step back, and often it's our representatives who look at things more broadly, who say, but then what do I do? I've got the numbers. How do I turn this into change? Because for UNICEF, that's what it's about. You need to be delivering results for children. Process can be fine, but you need to be delivering results for children. That process has to connect. Um, and I say here an FAQ of the brave because it's one of these simple questions, you know, and sometimes it takes a lot of bravery, I think, to ask ask the simple questions, but also the ones that are, are most challenging. So this is what is guiding us in this work, is to really try to understand what we can do with multidimensional poverty measures to make a change for children. So we try and bear this in mind throughout um, and would you know, welcome as part of the conversation, support in answering this question as well as possible, having the examples and, and so on. So as a beginning to looking at this question, um, we produced with the Global Coalition to End Child Poverty that Sabina mentioned a, a, a guide to a world free from child poverty to be aligned with the SDGs. And as probably everybody knows, there is now a, a SDG one includes both a clear focus on multidimensional poverty, but also on children and ensuring that we're looking at child poverty. And so this tried to bring an initial sort of structuring to the way we look at our child poverty work. It's not simply about measurement, it's about a path of impact that we're trying to achieve in, in countries. And after working with many in the coalition, with, with those working in countries, this was the pathway that we, that we developed. So you see these sort of five steps here, which starts with building a national pathway to end child poverty, developing interest, building motivation and support to move forward. The second is measuring child poverty. That's obviously a crucial foundation. You can't really address what you don't, what you don't measure. Um, the third was putting child poverty on the map and child poverty advocacy. So getting the information out there. The fourth was reducing child poverty through policy and program change. And then the fifth was achieving the SDGs and ending extreme child poverty. So really the end goal. Of, 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 uh, of getting there, um, including sort of enshrining child poverty in national plans and with national targets following the SDGs. So this was the sort of pathway that we developed and this guide is organized across this pathway and brings together lots of different um, examples of, of how this can be done. Um, but these last three are somewhat tricky. Um, these are um, in the guide, but the really question is how, how does it work? How does it work? putting child poverty on the map, what does that lead to? Reducing child poverty through policy and program change. I mean, there's a, there's a path between doing the measure and identifying the policies and having them happen. And similarly with achieving the SDGs in term, in, and ending extreme poverty. So this was the, these are the areas in this sequence that we, that we feel remain with a lack, of, a lack of clarity and what we wanted to address. Um, so the objectives of the study are 
first have a clearer sense of good practice on how to use measurement to change policies and programs, as well as where the limits might be. So really come up with something which is which is sort of very realistic and through and through practice. Uh, the second is to understand a little bit more the process issues around measurement that are important. Because I think what we what we find is that if if there's a particular approach or process around how the measurement is done, it's more likely to have an impact. Uh, and then ask this question of where choosing different measures, different multi-dimensional child poverty measures might make a difference. Um, so let us say a little bit about how we went about this, this work, the methodology of the work. Um, so the first thing to say is we're focused here on actual examples of impact based on multidimensional po child poverty measures. It, this this, this uh, report aims to be exclusively looking at real examples. So not how it might be done or it could be done, but how it has been done. So we're really trying to draw from practice and draw our conclusions from from practice. And we felt that was a very important a sort of gap in what is out there uh, in a way which has been brought together um, and very important for our colleagues in countries and others working on these measures to, to have a sense of. So we look at over 30 case studies and examples um, across, the, uh, across the six regions with an effort to be as exhaustive as we can. Um, it's important to note that we focus on all multidimensional poverty measures, regardless of the approach. So our, our ultimate focus is on child poverty and reducing child poverty, but there is so much to be learnt from multidimensional poverty more, la more, large, uh, more, la more largely. Um, it's not quite the right word, but you know what I mean? Uh, in terms of seeing, well, how has an MPI affected policy, even if it wasn't child specific? And then, of course, some MPIs are looking at child disaggregations or child specific approaches. So we're really looking across these different types of methodologies and the ones really that are most commonly out there in the in the literature and examples are the Bristol approach, which is where UNICEF began its work, MODA, the multiple overlapping deprivation analysis, which is sort of currently a, a mainstay in UNICEF's work, uh, and of course the MPI. Um, so we're really looking across all of these, all of these different methodologies in the way that we're looking. Um, so we had a review of 92 reports and papers uh, built on key search terms to, to, to look at all the published work we could, try to be really comprehensive in all the published work that we could, as well as an in-depth analysis of 25 full reports, which really had a lot of information on that we could use. We also had uh, a qualitative component. So we, in, we had interviews with 24 key stakeholders in multidimensional poverty use uh, to get a sense of what they saw were the strengths and the weaknesses of multidimensional poverty measurement, uh, what are the barriers and facilitators to the uptake of multidimensional poverty for policy and programs, and the kind of impact that multidimensional poverty measurement can have on policies and programs. So this informed the overall report that will be coming out, but there will also be a separate um, qualitative report that will, that will be coming out. So among the sort of limitations and, and biases, um, which I think are worth noting, one is to a degree there is a focus on child specific measures just because of the number of child poverty reports that are produced. So for UNICEF, when we do multidimensional child poverty, it almost always comes with a report, um, which means that there are write ups. Um, which gives you more information, whereas that may not be the case um, uh, of the MPI. So there can be some great examples out there which actually haven't been put together in ways that we can find or have been able to find. Um, and it's also important to note that there are um, language barriers. So our focus has been very much on examples with, a, with an English writer. So these are, these are a couple of issues that we're aware of. So on to the actual pathways of impact that we are drawing from all of this work. So first of all, just to look at the way in which we're organizing, um, organizing this. So we go back here at the top to this pathway, these five pathways, five milestones of work on child poverty. And there's sort of an alignment between these pathways and then the impact pathways that we have uh, organized this work through. Um, so you have impact pathway one, which is how these measures have been used to raise awareness and change the language and concept of poverty. 
impact pathway two was the identification of policies and programs. So how can the measures themselves be used to really guide um, what we could be doing in terms of targeting policies and programs on multi-sectoral priorities, informing budgets, and on social protection. And these four really emerge from the, the literature review. And then the third impact pathway um, is how these measures have been used in embedding multidimensional poverty in government agendas, guiding national plans and embedding in ME frameworks. So we wanted to come up with something that was that was reasonably clear to, to make it understandable for those who are going to use it. And it's very helpful for us to provide linkages between what we're doing now and these initial milestones, because these sort of provide the guiding frame for our work. So it sort of keeps coherence to have, have some sort of form of alignment. And, and we think this alignment works, works reasonably well. So we just wanted to say a little bit about what the information looks like uh, that we're looking at before we draw conclusions from it, because you can see it's not, it's not always clean or sometimes it's cleaner than other times. Um, so for example, and these, these ones don't have countries on, but people may be able to guess them. Um, so the top one is multidimensional poverty estimates produced since 2019 have helped to bring the attention of government, oh, this one does have a country, and development partners on the challenge. The president's speech at the 2020 Afghanistan pledging conference used multidimensional poverty trend analysis to highlight the challenge of poverty and the need for continued donor support. So, I mean, this is a really high profile example of, of it entering into the policy discourse, but it's still quite hard to, you can see how it's been used, but it's quite hard to pull apart. So it has helped bring attention, you know, oh, how do I go back? Um, so, so drawing exactly what happened in these examples is really quite difficult uh, or can be. So the next one is the UNICEF commissioned multidimensional child poverty study generated outstanding media coverage and supported advocacy to increase investment for children and adopt routine child poverty measurement to assess progress on SDG1. Um, so again, it sounds like there's been a lot of very positive coverage and it supported advocacy to increase investment and adoption of routine child poverty measurement in the SDGs. Um, but it again can be hard to pull apart. And I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone of writing uh, case studies, which read in a way which have a very positive sense. Um, but it can, again, be, it can be tricky to, to pull out the, the specificities. Um, this next one on multidimensional child poverty analysis has informed the implementation of a cash plus program in Burkina Faso. The cash plus program with components on washing nutrition will be implemented in four regions with high incidence of multidimensional poverty. Um, so this is sort of quite common. You'll see the word it informed, uh, it informed the implementation of the program. But again, we don't always know exactly what does that information look like? How influential was it? Um, and then you have ones which are, which are really pretty crisp. So the MPI has been used as one of the five criteria for allocation of national resources to local governments in 2013. Um, so there you have a very clear sense of how, of how something has, has, been, uh, has been used. So anyway, we wanted to share these just to give a feel for the, the base information and the complexity of trying to draw conclusions from it in ways which we, we think are helpful as we, as we move the work forward. Um, so now what we're going to do is just go through the impact pathways. There are these, there are the three impact pathways we, we looked at, and we're just going to point out the key conclusions that came from these impact pathways. So this is really the, the, the currently the key conclusions of the draft, um, the draft report. And I probably should have stressed at the moment, this report is in a late draft stage. So these sorts of conversations are going to be very helpful in terms of finalizing it, reaching new examples, understanding if the conclusions are solid, uh, so on. So the, the first impact pathway was advocacy and changing the poverty discourse. Um, and what you can see here is that uh, multidimensional poverty measures have consistently played a critical role in changing the understanding of poverty beyond income to the multiple dimensions of poverty. That seems to be very consistent and clear and, um, and emerges as a really strong area of impact. Um, they have strong ability to generate media attention and have been used effectively to reach wide and diverse audiences on multidimensional poverty and child poverty uh, and mobilizing action. So that media attention comes through many, many examples um, very, very strongly. For child poverty reports in particular, they have highlighted almost universally its higher prevalence than adult poverty. So that's come through as a very strong um, uh, 
message, which is which is also actionable. Um, now, the impact of these pathways through advocacy to policy and program change are often indirect. So getting to that direct point, okay, so where did this advocacy lead or where did this greater knowledge of multidimensional versus just looking at monetary poverty lead? It's very difficult to say and to draw, but that is not to say it doesn't have a lot of value. Um, and I think this is something in UNICEF that we need to keep stressing. So when people ask the question, what do you do with it? It can sometimes be they, they're looking for something more concrete, a more concrete line from, from advocacy and changing the understanding of poverty. But I think this is, these are very, it's very important to both value the, the, these impacts um, at the same time, trying to understand the pathways, but accepting that, they're, that they're, they can be tricky. Um, and, and intuitively, and I say intuitively, we say intuitively here more because it's, again, hard to really pull from the evidence, where advocacy has been combined with clear policy actions and asks, the pathways to the change can be seen more clearly. Um, um, but it is hard to be very clear on this. But if you combine the advocacy with, and this is what we should do, then um, you have a, a much better chance of making that difference. And here on the side, you have a couple of the the examples of where we've seen this happen. Afghanistan, actually, we mentioned briefly, briefly in the previous in the previous slide. Uh, and here's an example of Brazil, which during the 2018 presidential election, UNICEF launched a really significant advocacy campaign based on multidimensional child poverty analysis with proposed actions. And it got massive media coverage and, and pledges from uh, uh, candidates. So you can see these are these are real real changes which are happens, happening. So, so the advocacy and change in the poverty discourse, I think there's little doubt about. And I think it's the one area where there were so many examples we couldn't actually be um, comprehensive. So impact pathway two, and in a way this is the this is the biggest one because we're going to go through these four different sections. So this is about identifying policies and programs to reduce child poverty. And the question we saw at the beginning, what do we do it? What do we do with it? What do we use it for? This, I think, was where the question was, was going. How do we take these numbers to tell us what to do? Um, and so I think this deserves like a lot, of, a lot of looking at and clarity, certainly from, from our perspective. So um, the first of the four was on targeting. So the most common recommendation when you look at reports is broad targeting of geographic areas and groups in poverty based on a multi-dimensional poverty measure. So what you find is reports frequently highlight disparities in multidimensional poverty rates and recommend broad shifts in response, um, which may be for particular regions. I think that is the most common. It may look at um, age group differentials, or if the data allows, it may look at other, other forms of, of differentials, particular uh, groups within, within country. So that comes across as a very important recommendation. It's still broad. It's not telling you exactly what to do, but it's saying there's a, a broad multidimensional problem in, in some areas. So that comes, comes through quite strongly. Um, however, due to the survey limitations of the, of, the, of the measures, which draw from household surveys, not something at an individual level, these targeting re recommendations uh, remain broad rather than, rather than down to specific households or, or families. And that's something which uh, will come up again later. So, um, here, for example, um, and maybe we'll hear more from Gonzalo on this, I don't know, in Mexico, the multidimensional poverty measure was used to identify the top priority mun municipalities requiring extra intervention. So it really did guide, this is where we need to be uh, putting, our, putting our, our focus. So that was uh, just one of the examples which comes through in this area. So the second or B, so we're still in the same impact pathway about identifying policies and programs, but now looking at the next most common approach, uh, which was the importance of measures guiding multi-sectoral approaches and coordination. So here, corresponding to the multi-sectoral nature of, of, of multidimensional poverty, reports frequently point to the need for investment across sectors and better coordination, pointing to areas of deprivation overlap. So really arguing for integrated approaches uh, integrated policy and program responses to deal with the multidimensional poverty challenges that are faced. Um, but again, this is a pretty broad level. It's a pretty broad statement on the need for a focus at the multi-sectoral uh, level. Um, 
the, the measures sometimes have been used to direct focus for the implementation of multisectoral programs uh, and identifying priority geographical areas for multisectoral interventions and really using the measure to then bring together stakeholders um, to figure out, okay, how do we actually take this to the next level and make things make things happen? And again, uh, Mexico, which comes through consistently as a, as, a, as a very strong example. And as we do these breakdowns, you'll often, well, we find in the report, oh yeah, Mexico fits here and it fits here and it fits here. So you have some countries which sort of cut across. Um, and so, and so what, what was able to be done there was developing national strategies to design and coordinate multi-sectoral policies. Uh, with the reduction of MPI as the as the main goal. So it went beyond a statement that this is something we should be doing to actually bringing people together and make it happen. Uh, and from what we've seen, that is quite um, unusual in the in the literature that we've reviewed. Um, they have rarely been used to directly guide, multi measures have rarely been used to directly guide policy simply to reduce the measure. Uh, and I think this is an important one to focus on for a second, because in a way, multidimensional pov poverty measures have a simply tell you what you need to do to reduce multidimensional poverty. It's sort of a straightforward thing. You know what the indicators are, you know what to reduce, and you go ahead and do it. Um, but we find actually that doesn't happen very much. Um, and and uh, the reason why uh, we think is because they can guide you in ways which then you take a step back and it's like, well, actually, maybe that isn't the key area we want to focus. So for example, MODA is an interesting example. It will often come up with either sanitation or housing as the highest area of deprivation for children. Um, and it doesn't tally, that result doesn't tally with um, policymakers um, or indeed child advocates as the key area to improve. Maybe because there are other areas which are more crucial for children, nutrition, education, health, but also because the policy difficulty of changing different dimensions um, is varies by, by, by different deprivation. So that sort of almost tautological approach to taking the index and just wanting to reduce the index directly isn't something that we see, see happening um, too, too much. Now, there have been some efforts to analyze the multidimensional poverty um, package to identify sort of an optimal policy package which can respond and reduce multidimensional poverty overall. But it's an extremely difficult thing to do. And I think for some of our colleagues, this is maybe what, they, what they'd be hoping for. Um, so, so for example, in, in income poverty, it's more possible to run simulations and say, well, these are the actions which will reduce uh, income or monetary poverty. But for multidimensional poverty, because of the, com the complexity of the measure, taking that step back and being able to analytically say, well, here's the one, two, three things that could really make the big difference is not something which is easy to do and in practice uh, really hasn't been used, even though there have been um, some efforts. Okay, so um, we're now on the third C, um, and there's one more in this impact pathway, which is the use of multidimensional poverty measures to guide and influence national and subnational budgets. Um, and this is the third most common recommendation. So what you find in, in a number of reports and, and recommendations is the importance of increasing the effectiveness and uh, efficiency of budgeting to reduce multidimensional poverty. But again, <clears throat> this tends to be a quite broad recommendation um, on the need to improve budgeting rather than something which is drawn very specifically from the identification of, of the policies and programs which, which need to change. Um, but not to say not an important one and, a, and not a guiding one for, for many countries. And there are some limited examples of multidimensional poverty being used really much more directly. Uh, and these have come from uh, MPI examples in Nepal, Nepal and Bhutan, where they're both using the MPI directly for budget allocation formulas. So, so these examples do exist, but uh, are unusual in the grand scheme of, of everything we're, we're doing we're seeing. So when you look overall, and here are some examples, you can see in Cambodia, um, the multidimensional child poverty measure led to the inclusion of child poverty in sort of key annual budget formulation guidance. So it was there, and hopefully it was influential, but that's not direct in the same way as we have in Bhutan, where, as we mentioned, it was one of the five criteria for the allocation of national resources to, to local governments. Um, so it's important, it's influential, but often it's not super direct. So finally, in the second impact pathway, um, 
social protection is commonly included as a, as a policy recommendation for addressing multidimensional poverty. So we see these in lots of reports. Uh, and as a program, you know, social protection is, has these broad multi-sectoral impacts. So it makes a lot of sense as, as a program which can make an overall, overall dif difference. Um, again, it's not, it's not derived particularly analytically in the examples we've seen. It's rather that we have a multidimensional pro poverty problem. We know social protection has really broad influence across areas of children's lives. So it's a very good recommendation. There's a fit rather than it being, you know, more carefully analytically drawn from the measurement. Um, but it's also important to note that in UNICEF, the, well, I work, I'm, you know, my, the, the unit I'm part of is child poverty and social protection. So it speaks to these things moving together. And of course, when you have an institutional connection like that, you can also see these, these connections uh, come through. Um, but as noted earlier, there aren't examples really of multidimensional measures being used to target specific social protection programs to households and individuals. It has been done with secondary data collection measures which allow you to look more closely at the at the, at the sort of individual and, and household level and it's an area which I think is quite interesting given the ongoing conversations and challenges around targeting to look at that in a little bit more um, a little bit more more carefully um, and then you'll see, I think we've touched on both these examples previously. So you can see just a couple of those there on the side, but I think for time, I'll keep moving on. So finally, we get to impact pathway three, which is the embedding of multidimensional poverty in, in government agendas. So really making it a fundamental part of what governments do and what they look at. And what we find here is the frequent inclusion of child poverty in key national plans, um, providing long-term systematic and secure sustainable funding. Well, that's the hope. So once you have it in the national development plan, um, it's it really is embedded in a way that can be can be uh, come back to. And increasingly, and supported by the push of the SDGs, multidimensional child poverty has been included as a key indicator in national monitoring and evaluation frameworks. Um, so these these are positive uh, positive things uh, because of the you know the way they embed in government agendas, but of course you, one's left with the, still the question of whether the inclusion of these indicators and targets has or will change the course for child poverty in countries, and it's hard to evaluate, and it's likely to vary a lot by country. You have some countries for whom these plans are genuine uh, genuine guiding documents that they will that will need to follow. There are others where the challenges are so great that the realities of following the plan becomes almost impossible. And so even though something's in a plan, there are second levels of prioritization in terms of uh, what actually what actually gets done. Um, and, and here you can just see a couple of examples. So in Kenya, the multidimensional child poverty work was really instrumental at the sub-national level of development plans and became became integrated into those those plans. Um, and in Ethiopia, both monetary and multidimensional uh, poverty and, and the advocacy with it led to the inclusion of these indicators in the 10-year um, the 10 year perspective development plan, which really gives a foundation for coming back and making sure that we're that we're moving forward on these areas. So, so we see this as a as a very important and fruitful area, even though it comes with comes with uncertainties. Um, OK, so that was the that's the end of the piece, which is going through the uh, sort of impact pathways as we saw them. So now just a, a, a few final slides on the importance of the process, what we've learned about how, how important the process matters, which I think for us, we find extremely important for how we move, we move forward. So what emerges uh, in terms of process and what makes, a, what makes a difference? Here are some of the sort of key bullets. The first is the importance of leadership and champions. And this, came, this comes through uh, very strongly when we're talking to the, uh, having the qualitative interview. Um, and, and we have a very nice quote here on this one. We really try to find the champions and they really don't have to be presidents. It's one of my favorite quotes, this one. They don't have to be presidents. It helps, we, we, we don't mind, but you, it doesn't have to be presidents. It has to be someone who will keep activating the people around them to work and keep, and keep pushing. Um, and I think for us in UNICEF, I don't know uh, who, who this quote was from. It may have been someone from UNICEF, but it, um, it, this really also highly is, uh, we, we relate to this a lot, that, that idea of, in, of finding people who really can help and push to take this work forward at a national level is really important. Um, the second is coalition building, um, which kind of comes through very strongly and is related to champions, but is about then building a broader group who want to stand behind uh, this push 
to see poverty in a different way and to, to find the solutions for it. And it's very important we find because there's, there's a coming and going in a lot of countries and a lot of positions. And so it, it, having that solidity across organizations can help keep the work moving, moving forward. The awareness and connection with the policy making process um, came through as really, really crucial. So being very savvy and very aware um, of, of how to engage the measurement and the building of ownership and the building understanding with how policies are being made. The fourth one is avoiding the confusion of too many measures. And this is an interesting one, which comes up in some countries where you may have an MPI or you may have a MODA uh, and then another institution coming and saying, no, no, we actually think this would be a, a really good way of doing it. We should add that. And I think that what came through for many is the need to avoid having too many different things going on. There's a limited amount of, of policymaker space uh, that people can take before you, you keep adding measures. And I think that's something important for us as a community who works on this, but sometimes on different measures to really be aware of and work on, work on together. Um, and then finally, the importance of further analysis beyond the multidimensional poverty measure. And I think one of the themes which has hopefully sort of come through the previous slides is that very frequently these measures are good at raising awareness and pointing general directions, but getting specific often, uh, very usually requires uh, a further analysis that takes you beyond, um, beyond the, the initial measurement. And here there's an example of Chile, which there was really sort of high level political commitment and the impacts that can have in driving um, a really strong, a really strong process. But again, I don't want to run out of time, so I'm just going to move on. Um, so then what are the implications for measurement? So in a way, this comes in a circle. And for us, this is a really important circle. So we're looking at like how have measures been influential. But as we've seen all of that, well, what does that mean for measurement and, and, and how we go about it and how we how we approach it? Um, and this is particularly important in countries where there may be multiple potential approaches and coming up with what's the best way to, to move forward. Um, so the implications here, we break them down by the, by the impact pathways we, we have, just to try and clarify the conclusion. So on impact pathway one, advocacy and change in the poverty discourse, all measures have been used effectively for advocacy. We've seen that without, without question. So depending on context, some may be more effective than others from an advocacy perspective. So for example, being able to compare adults and children might be really useful to highlight that children are more likely to be in poverty than adults and connect more effectively to overall adult debates than to have just a child measure or to have two measures that don't sit next to each other in a way that they can be comparable. So if that's something that's important, that is an implication to think about when thinking about how to move forward on, uh, on, on measures. Um, and then you have measures which are, are more focused directly on children and, and indeed some are more rights based in their approach, which may be important in some countries. So, so there could be at circumstances where, where those measures would be uh, more effective for advocacy. So as everything, it's context specific, but hopefully this tries to pull apart some of those context considerations. Um, so impact pathway two, and this is, I think, a really significant piece, is that the, so in terms of identifying policies and programs to reduce child poverty, what do we um, know about what the implications are for measures? Um, and in general, multidimensional poverty measures most commonly identify broad policy conclusions. So the co conclusions are pretty broad. Therefore, the choice of measure will not generally differentiate policy conclusions. So what we've seen, given the conclusions are generally quite broad on the policy side, the, the different measures wouldn't lead you to have a different policy set at the end of them. That's a, that's a sort of general uh, conclusion. Um, there are important exceptions to this, um, and that's important to consider if one is an exception or not. So this example of guiding the budget allocation formulas would be where the measure would make a really big difference because that measure is going into the allocation formula. So if there are differences in the in the numbers being produced by different measures, and we have this in the paper, not in the presentation, that will make a real big difference. Um, and then in Mexico, the national uh, uh, multidimensional poverty approach is, is sort of linked directly to triggering shifts in government focus. So there, the measurement also could have uh, a different measurement could have a, a significantly different uh, impact but it's not true overall. So in general, advocacy and ownership considerations um, are important in driving the choice of measure as we balance this up. Uh, and working on multidimensional poverty 
we should be prepared for the extra research and analysis beyond the measure which derived the policy conclusions. And when we're doing the extra analysis, the top measure is unlikely to make a difference into what the bottom analysis were. And then finally, uh, embedding the multidimensional poverty and government agendas. I mean, really the effectiveness here uh, on one measure or the other really relates to how well uh, how owned they are, the advocacy impacts, and how good they've been at changing the discourse of poverty and the, these questions of, of uh, if they do indeed identify particular policies or not. So this is really just follows from, from the other two. Um, okay, I think I'm running out of time, but I think I don't have too many slides, so I'm gonna go through them quite quickly and we should be okay. So we just wanted to say a quick word on the pros and cons of having a child-focused measure. And this is the view from the qualitative um, assessment. So we asked people, well, do you think it's important to have something that focuses specifically on children or not? Um, and these are, the, these are the quick conclusions. So in essence, seven, we had a total of 15 who answered this question. Seven said, yeah, it's good to have a measure which has a focus on children. It could be child focused. I mean, not just a disaggregation, could be a disaggregation of the MPI, or you could have something which is child focused, but it's important to have something. Um, five people said, um, it's really important to have something which is really focused on children and not just a disaggregation because here it will draw out different conclusions. Um, and then three said it's actually not always useful to have a child centered measure because having a child centered measure can just add confusion to something which is already complex and then why not a measure for, for say women or for the older people or for so on. It can become too complicated. In this case, I imagine the disaggregation would still be fine. Um, because it would it would be it would still allow the cohesion. So anyway, I've raced over this a little bit. Maybe it will come up more in the question. But it's certainly interesting from our perspective to get different people's take on this because it's important for us ultimately to have a sense of you know what's the best way to go forward in terms of measurement. Okay, so this is I'm quite hopeful the last slide. So just looking at some of the future directions and some of the intangibles which which emerged. So in terms of future directions. Can we do more to identify the policy mix which addresses multidimensional child poverty overall, this idea of an optimal package? There has been some work done on this, um, and certainly the goal of this uh, uh, review is not to say, well, this hasn't really happened, so it can't happen. It's just to say, well, this is what's happened, but is there still room to look at this sort of broader policy approaches? How can we do that best? And for us, we think that's really important to be able to provide governments with a, with a sense of, of which direction. Um, the second is improving the data and, and new indicators, um, and a conversation about where to focus there. This is in terms of what the actual household surveys contain, so we can produce uh, stronger multidimensional child poverty measures. Um, the third here is using multidimensional child poverty measures to inform relief responses during crisis. This is coming up a lot in UNICEF now. So we currently have this PDNA as a post-disaster needs assessment, like a way of rapidly understanding what's going on in a, in a post-crisis context. Can we learn from the work done on multidimensional poverty? Is there room to provide integration to, to give a sort of multidimensional lens and organization, because these things already look across dimensions, to, to take this work forward? Um, uh, and then a question about using, can we use multidimensional poverty better for more individual targeting? And again, this is coming up a lot, like the challenges of proxy means testing as a means to, to target. Can multidimensional poverty approaches uh, inform there? And then some final, the final, the final points here, some intangibles. The, the, the process from advocacy to impact remains murky. And maybe that's okay. I mean, I think it's great to, to increase our learning and understanding of that for sure. But certainly from our perspective, we can be pretty sure when you have high level of advocacy impact, that's really important. Um, but nonetheless, it is, it is murky. And then a question uh, which came as we worked through this is, is are some measures better at build, building high level support uh, than others? So even if policy responses aren't clearly differentiated, are there some characteristics of measurement which help them get these champions and this high level support? Um, because that would be a really useful thing to understand and know a little bit more. Um, and that's it. I'm sorry if I went a little bit over there, James. I think maybe I did. So apologies and back over to you guys and I'll, I'll stop the share now. Not at all. That was, uh, that was most comprehensive and interesting, particularly that last bit as to whether um, some approaches are are somehow maybe behaviorally linked to better outcomes. But uh, I, I think the entire package was a, 
was a clear delineation of the ways in which multidimensional measures uh, lead to policy action. So I'm going to turn it over to Gon uh, Gonzalo now. Um, as I do, I want uh, those of you who are in the audience to, uh, to think about submitting chat questions, if you would, or if you want to hold your hand up toward the end, that's also an alternative uh, in order to be heard in this discussion. But over to Gonzalo. Thank you very much, uh, James. Thank you to George Washington University, to the Institute of International uh, for Economic Policy, to Kyle, David, the Salt Room, Sabina, thank you very much. I mean, I guess, I guess this is really a good opportunity to talk about the use of, I mean, the use of, of uh, multidimensional poverty indicators, finally. I mean, at the beginning, when we started many of these talks, huh? I mean, I wonder if my, if my colleagues agree with me, but it was mainly a more technical, a more technical debate about uh, going beyond um, income or trying to capture better how poverty should should look at the concept of poverty. Um, I mean, it's true that those interested in poverty measurements uh, are also interested in poverty reduction. I mean, that's true. But, but I, from my point of view, uh, I, re I really believe that in the beginning, we, we talk about um, even uh, uh, back beyond 2007 and six or uh, back with Bur Bourguignon, Ch Chakravarti and Amartya Sen's work, uh, was mainly an academic debate about uh, going beyond income. Um, so, um, I mean, I remember a, a Mexican researcher who has been working on multidimensional poverty measurement for ages. Um, and when he was congressman, he pushed really hard to have uh, a multidimensional indicator in the law. And uh, I mean, and, and at the end of the day, he was successful because uh, the Mexican law had the multidimensional poverty, not only because of this person, but uh, but but uh, when the law was um, approved, uh, we didn't talk about the link to to policy spe specifically. Specifically, we we just talk about uh, that this may be a better way of measuring poverty. Uh, so, but but finally, when the measurement was uh, already there, I mean, it made sense to go to the next step. How can we going to use it? Um, so, so on one hand, this step uh, is not very easy usually because the measures were not designed for a specific uh, use, for instance, for targeting. We didn't say, well, what would be the best tool to improve targeting in public policy? We, we didn't go that way. We went the other way around. So it, it is not that easy uh, to go to, to the use when you did, didn't design that way. But on the, on the other hand, unlike income poverty, multidimensional poverty was from the beginning public policy friendly and politicians started to get this message. So for instance, if a government is able to, um, to place a, a child in school, then the government is reducing poverty at, this, at, at that very moment, at the spot. Um, if a government improves the quality of housing for, for poor people, then immediately, according to a national poverty indicator, then poverty goes down. And this doesn't happen with income, uh, income poverty. I mean, you need more time, you need to wait for when the schooling um, takes um, this, this, this advantage. So, uh, so this is very appealing for, for public policy. And politicians started to noticing that. Um, it's very appealing for, for politicians. So I remember when we started the, our, our measurement, it was at the middle of the, of the government of Presidente Calderón. And we really tried to, to engage government with a, with a new measurement, but they were not very interested because they started the government with, a, with an income uh, approach. Their, their, their national uh, policies and the national programs, they were designed with an with income approach. So it was very difficult, but when the president realized that uh, he was able to reduce poverty in the short run with a new uh, device, then 
uh, we got his attention. And uh, so, so he, was, he was very keen to, to use it. Um, so that is why, having said that, that this, is a, this paper, this effort made by David and Solrum is a, is a, is a great opportunity. It's, a, it's going to be a very important uh, document to talk about use and how to improve it. It's going to be very useful for, for, for OFI, for UNICEF, because we all want to talk about um, policy now. Um, within OFI, we are just moving from, from the technical element talking with countries to the policy part. The policy part really plays a, a very important uh, part of, of our daily um, exchange with countries um, all the time. So I think, I'm, I mean, congratulations to, to David, to Solrum for this very important um, document uh, that we are, we, are, we are facing here. And hopefully many people will read it very quickly. Uh, let me just uh, talk about certain aspects of the document. Um, the first one is the most important part of the paper, as uh, David said, it was a very detailed review of uses with loads of country examples. And, and this is going to be very useful. I mean, examples, as he said, about targeting, budget, program, uh, prioritization, coordination between ministries. Uh, in every single section, the paper shows plenty of, of country examples. Um, and it's going to be very useful to understand how can we use in the future uh, a multidimensional poverty measurement. By the way, I mean, very much as normal, normal, nomad land in the Oscars yesterday, Colombia is nominated for almost all categories, <laughs> uh, which only means that Colombia has been really working uh, not only on the technical part of the, of the indicator, but also in trying to use it in various ways. So I think that's an interesting way to mention it. Um, one, one suggestion, if I, if I may. I believe that the accountability part is not um, that, that clear in the paper. And sometimes I believe for many countries, perhaps accountability was the main driver from the beginning uh, to try to make accountable governments, state governments, and ministries. So, uh, I, I mean, sometimes Congress is the one asking for the, for the measurement and therefore accountability uh, is there. And, and it means that uh, we, we, not only accountability for governments, accountability for, for, for states and for ministries, as I said. No? I believe that in various occasions when poverty goes up, the only responsible uh, ministry is the social development uh, minister. And, um, and it doesn't make sense. Uh, when we have a multidimensional poverty indicator, then it is clear that many other ministers are responsible for poverty reduction. So I, I, so I believe that um, including accountability is not that easy because it's not that easy to, to, to know how countries are being used at it. But I believe we can, and you can go on that direction eventually. I mean, the, the title of the, of the paper, from my point of view, should be the policy, advocacy, and accountability use of multidimensional poverty measurements. So we may have like the figure one of the milestones on the pathway to address child poverty. We may have a second figure about pathways, pathways to address accountability. Um, it is also important to mention that, as, as David said, as the paper said, that um, multidimensional poverty measurements are a good entry point for, for, um, for SDGs. Uh, this is a key element. I don't think countries have been working on that uh, uh, recently, but I think we have to make an effort to do that. And I think my last comment, if I just go beyond the uh, I think James, one, one minute or two minutes, is that the document talks about how can we bridge somehow be, between the, the indicator and the, and the policy use. And that bridge is about 
convincing, it's about advocacy, it's about politics. It's, it's an art, the art of, uh, of, of selling the product. And that's a very important element. By the way, in OFI, we have been working on a handbook precisely on this. How can we, how can we convince better? Because some, sometimes uh, we as an academic, we are not that very good in convincing. Uh, Sabina is, but not all, not all of us are. So we need some elements. And, and the paper shows that in, in, in that section about the foundations for effectively using um, multinational poverty, they talk about that. Uh, they mentioned the importance of, of, uh, of political context. M my suggestion is that they may have to include or st stress more the importance of incentives. Incentives are very, very important. Whenever you link the political incentives of politicians with the indicator, then then magic appears, as James says. You know, so when so in in in, in the in the the state of Mexico called Puebla, this governor wanted to be a president, and therefore during his mandate, he did everything possible, uh, starting on the budget, in trying to reduce multidimensional poverty according to the to the definition. In fact, uh, I remember that his Minister of Finance told me once, you know, Gonzalo, you made, Coneval made my life easier because I keep receiving ministries and they keep telling me that they need money for this, this and that. But the government told me, you only, he said, uh, you only should accept projects reducing multinational poverty according to these indicators. So, I mean, it's, it's very unfortunate that the Puebla didn't, uh, didn't write down uh, this experience, but it was a very interesting experience where, again, you link incentives to the MPI. Um, uh, so therefore, I just close by saying, I close by saying that uh, this is going to be a very important document for, for, for bridging between the technical, the technical element the indicator and the policy side. So again, congratulations uh, to David and Solomon. Thank you. Thank you, Gonzalo, for your concise uh, discussion of, well, a history that you were in the middle of in Mexico and then extending on to your impact in Colombia and across Latin America and beyond. Um, now, I'd like to shoot it back to David and to Solo if there is uh, there are some parts that you'd like to respond to. Please go ahead. But remember, the rest of you be thinking of your questions uh, as we uh, hear back from the speakers. Proceed. Thanks so much, Gonzalo. Thanks, James. Really important and thought-provoking um, comments. Um, Sola, I don't know, should I just give a few thoughts and then you come in with a few thoughts or do you want to come in? That sounds good. Go ahead. Okay. Um, First of all, just to agree on this question of moving from poverty measurement to thinking about policy, because I think it's I've spent time lost in the pol poverty measurement world, and it's very interesting this transition which we're we're trying to go we're trying to go through. Um, I think the, the this big point on accountability is a really important um, is a really important piece, um, and I think that's. I don't think I think it's something that we have to think about. How do we get that information better? Because I think it's. It, it you you it's very it's right what you say I mean it's we've ma we've managed to look at it through the stuff we see on paper in a simple way right so it's in the ME framework it's in the national development plan these are important things but there's there are other levels of pieces which are going on which maybe aren't aren't fully captured so we have to think I think a little bit about how to capture those examples um, well but both to stress the accountability more broadly think, but also to find the examples that may not be written up, which is the challenge. And I think if, if you're aware of them, and maybe it's a conversation with you to, to understand about Pueblo is, is one, but, but any other examples that can come our way, because I think as we were saying on the methodology, and Sola may say more about this, we're, we're sort of a little bit lost on what's been written down, and, and there's a lot there which is missing. Uh, so I just think we really do need to, to, to strengthen that. Um, and I think this is related to to what you were saying on the on the importance of 
of incentives. Um, it's it's this art. I mean, it's this art uh, of which you speak. And 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 what we want to do is try and capture that. Try and help people understand that because it's going to be useful for 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 folks who work on on it on our side on all sides to try and capture that. So maybe we need to think through. So I may have some thoughts about how we might do that, or if we can find if there are some stories we can we can find. Um, and related to this, and I and I had this as the last bullet. We had it as the last bullet of the slot of the whole thing, in a way, is the art of selling the product. What that, I mean, what is the, the that art of selling this product, which is so important that you get that high level support and high level buy in, and maybe that has implications for 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 measurement that people want to be. You know, some things are easier to sell than others for whatever reason, because their whole population, or because they have certain properties, or because, you know, um, I think there's something there to to investigate. Um, and then the final piece, just to say on the SDGs, and so let me come in more on this because she's done some work on this as well, is it's been it's been sort of disappointing the the transition into the SDG era and the pickup of measurement and reporting. And I think for all of us who are involved in in this world, we have to think like, oh, what's going on? What can we do about this? And and so we can give some data, but so few countries are reporting this data as part of their SDG reporting. And, and, and I think I, I was just like, yes, we've done it. We just sit now and it's gonna start happening. And it's, it really isn't. And I think between us, we can really move. We, we're, we're on the cusp of a world where it's just universal, normal countries own and report and, and measure multidimensional poverty, child poverty. So, so, so I think there's an issue there that maybe we can put our heads together on to, to try and shift. Um, Sola. Great, thanks. Thank you, Gonzalo and, and James and Sabina. Um, on the accountability, yeah, it's super important. The examples are not that many right now. Eh? We have Mexico, we have Colombia. The examples are very much Latin America because there's a longer history there of multidimensional poverty measures. So they're just a bit ahead of the world in terms of that. I think what we're seeing now with the SDGs, as, as David said, it's been slow pickup. We've had the SDGs since 2015, we're six years in, but still not that many countries are officially reporting on multidimensional poverty. They're doing the analysis, but it's not making its way into these SDG portals and so forth. Huh? But I think slowly but surely we're going to see it more there on, on, on these official documents. And that's when we're going to see the accountability more like, so here we have the measure, this is the baseline. Now what? How are we going to follow the progress and so forth? That said, we do have a bit of a disclaimer in, in the assessment saying, yes, it's amazing to link the measure to, to all these different ministries and have more accountability, a wider accountability to reducing poverty. But we want to also avoid simplistic policy recommendations. Eh? And that's what can also happen with a multidimensional poverty measure is you can focus in on not even one dimension, you could focus in on one indicator in a dimension and reduce that indicator and poverty goes down. But in reality, maybe children in poverty are not that much better off. Eh? So yes, we want more accountability, but we also want to avoid simple policy conclusions from the measure. Eh? We wanna go beyond the measure to, 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 to the policy recommendations. Great, thank you so much, Sola. Um, I believe the first person with question is Sabina Alkair. So take it away, Sabina. Yeah, thank you so much. I just, I really enjoyed this exchange um, and the report is really, really rich and it's asking exactly the right questions. And even if it's difficult to get clear answers from the policy documents, et cetera, you're setting an agenda of the kinds of questions that everybody needs to ask and also future kinds of analyses that need to become normal. So I had just a, a few different uh, spattering of very, very quick points. One is in the next step, I think it would also be good to have a little bit of a mention of indicators for children, um, because um, I always feel that some of the times the people who work on measurement are not the child experts. And sometimes the child experts may not work on measurement, but it would be good to have a space to see are there really important aspects of children's lives that could be in either household-based national MPIs or child MPIs, but where the surveys are not getting the right information? 
because that would just be a really interesting question. Um, and one of the reasons is that uh, OFI now are looking at the individual indicators in national MPIs, for example, child nutrition or children out of school, because one can do gendered and intra-household analyses of those. And I think that should become a standard part of the national MPI reporting framework. But are, are the right indicators included? So that's where we sort of need more insights. Um, on the SDGs, Gonzalo could tell you much more, but uh, the, the channel of reporting was just opened in 2020. Um, and so it's, it's still relatively recent, but hopefully um, that will pick up, as you said, and that's an area where our collaboration would be important. Um, I have just a couple comments, which I can email you about the points that you made. The only one where I thought maybe we could tweak it a bit is that there are some countries actually that take the MPI as a national target in Colombia or in Nepal or whatever, where it's written in their national plan, this is how much we want to reduce it in these years. So we could share those with you and, and have other examples as, as you requested. But there are two things I really wanted to ask, and they're very related. You said you'd like joint analysis or more analysis at the end, and I agree completely. But the question is what? You know, what's a process? You know, could Gonzalo with the MPPN and and you all, could we have a little bit of a brainstorm on exactly what kind of analysis needs to be done? Because I think it's something that could be done. The number of actors are limited, but giving clarity about what will be genuinely useful would be, I think, a huge leap forward in terms of guiding the field in that direction. And the second is related, obviously, to the pandemic, that now we are in a time where, very sadly, poverty and child poverty is increasing. And there will be a need, you know, for a big emphasis on um, reduction shortly, both in terms of the fast remote surveys that you mentioned and, and others. And so how can this work on measurement, which uses household surveys that are pre-COVID tend to be, how can it come into this remote survey, this, you know, COVID build back better? Um, what are changes that need to be taken so that we don't lose momentum and have a two year pause until there's more data? Um, so those would be two, two closing things. But, and I know they're not covered in the report, but the report is asking all of the right questions that sort of point in that direction. So it would just be lovely to hear your thoughts. Thank you. And uh, I'll bring it back. Gonzalo, you had one extra question, did you? Uh... Yeah, if possible. I, I mean, just very quickly, I really, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, you're I, right. I really believe, David, that the, we have to put our heads together, uh, OFI, UNICEF, the World Bank, and somehow relaunch target 1.2 of the SDGs. I mean, there's so much uh, that we can do there, that we can have, we'd have to do something <laughs> uh, e e e eventually. Um, I, I, would, I would also think that um, irrespective of uh, whether you have a, separate, a completely separate child indicator or one which is disaggregated from the main one, uh, I think in, in, in any case, partnership with civil society or with other institutions interested in, in child poverty is important. Uh, our engagement with, uh, with uh, UNICEF in Mexico was very, very successful and they really, they really uh, did many things in terms of policy uh, because of this uh, uh, partnership. I think that's, that's important. And of course, uh, Jacob, um, Jacob and Sabina have a very good paper about that. Uh, Jacob Dirksen and Sabina. So we have to also think, think about uh, these elements of uh, having one child poverty in one way or another, or another way. Great, so David and Sola, finishing thoughts. Um, this is yeah no I'm I'm very in line with these pieces. I mean I think on that great I mean to get these examples of where countries are targeting great please and in general if people have examples do send them our way because it's going to make it so much so much better and particularly examples where there are, there are gaps will be particularly like influential on the on on the piece so that would be hugely useful. Um, I think it would be I think there's a question of partnership broadly Gonzalo from from yourself but also from Sabina in terms of how we move forward on joint analysis 
Um, and I understand that to be sort of how does UNICEF and OFI, where, in, where we're working in the same place uh, or the, you know, the, the network more broadly, how do we get together in terms of sort of influencing and understanding what, the, what would the next steps be in the sort of policy, the policy uh, response? And I really would, I think we'd really value encouraging that. And we can come down to the practicalities of how to encourage that to happen, because I think where there are places where there may be different ways of looking at things, um, and we, we, this can be true when we work with the bank and other places where we don't always see exactly eye to eye, that joint analysis is just extremely useful. People come together and start to see concretely how do we move forward. And I think that's something that we could really encourage. And we could think through the details of what that looks like, connecting with the network more broadly, or is it a bit more looking country by country? I'm sure all of you have a good sense now of how UNICEF sort of operates and its decentralized model and you know its complexities, but that would be great to, to take on. Um, and then, then just to say, oh, this idea of relaunching 1.2, I think, would be could be pretty nifty to try and bring some some attention to that. Um, and and Sola may want to talk a little bit about the work we've been doing as part of the coalition, just to have a sense of how countries are reporting. So we do have a bit of an update. We do have a platform to a degree already to show where this is happening and where it isn't happening. So there's something that we could definitely definitely build on on there. Um, and Sola, in terms of the, the survey questions, because I know you've been doing some work on the possibilities of, of the remote surveys, the tele-surveys, those sorts of challenges. I don't know, they may know, I don't know if there are any conclusions there, but you might want to speak to that. So again, um, if this is my final word, huge thanks everybody. It was really been uh, really wonderful. Great, Sola, do you want to do the final, final word? I'm not a final, final, final word. Final, I want to just- for, Final for today in this uh, session, hopefully. <laughs> No, I just wanted to mention quickly on the survey, it's very true what Sabina says, like if we're not mentioning COVID and thinking about COVID, we sound a little tone deaf in the current situation. It's actually more promising than we thought in terms of household surveys. Mix, four countries last year went into the field, eh? despite the challenges there, and this year even more are going to go. So I don't th think the situation is as serious as we thought, where we were thinking we're not going to get any national household service in the next years, but they're going out there quicker than we thought. And I think the same probably for LSMS and DHS. That said, we have this high frequency phone monitoring service, which we could really tap into as a group. Eh? They have limitations, obviously. Eh? It's a phone survey. It's, you know, it's not always representative samples and so forth. And we get the same issue as with everything else. They usually do children zero to 14 years. It's something the bank just always does because after 14 years, children often start working. Eh? So they feel like <laughs> it's a different cut of. Um, that said, there's so much that are multidimensional. There's questions on health, education, usually you know something on food security and so forth. So definitely throwing our heads together and, and thinking about how can we reflect the impact of COVID on multidimensional poverty because the bank obviously is more focused on the income aspect. I think it's a great idea. But yeah, final words, David? Do you want to say some final? <laughs> final goodbye? Well, no, I'll say the final goodbye then and uh, take it uh, from here and say uh, thanks to all the audience for staying with us, uh, talking about multidimensional poverty and policy. We'll see you next week. Uh, and thank you very much.